So I'm going to talk today about um, immersive audio, spatial and immersive audio, um, which of course is, you know, a big part of VR and uh, virtual and augmented reality. Here's the talk outline. Um, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time uh, going into the human auditory system, and um, then we'll go into different parts of spe spatial audio, how you capture it, how you play it back, how you render, um, and then I'll go into some advanced topics related to this. What is spatial audio? So um, our, you know, our brains and our um, auditory system has evolved to detect audio in a 3D sense, right? So we can make sense of the world through our audio, auditory system. Spatial audio, at least the way I'm going to define it, is referring to technology that creates this effect virtually. So you can think of this as a lot of the same techniques or equivalent techniques to rendering VR and AR uh, video or, or a scene um, that you do graphically. You can do an equivalent type of thing in audio. Uh, in a 3D sense, and and hopefully by the as we go through this, you'll start to understand how this is done, and um, and so why why is this important? Um, so that, let, we can break this into two two things. Just from a VR AR perspective, you know our audio auditory system, of course, is very deeply tied to our emotions and to our sense of presence. So we can recreate our natural sense of presence in a virtual uh, sense, um, so for super realistic presence and audio. The other side, uh, which there's a lot of research in, is for uh, correcting and improving hearing loss. Um, so, you know, kind of the next step of hearing aids and um, things like that, uh, you can apply this technology to improve people's uh, deficiencies. And of course, as, as you get older, everyone has a natural decline of their auditory systems and that there's a lot of cognitive effects that go along with that. And so there's a lot of research into um, how to use technology to, to offset some of the cognitive decline related to auditory decline. And I'll cover a little bit of that later in the talk. Um, so the auditory system uh, well, before I do that, let me just tell you kind of how I've learned about this. So um, I've worked at Facebook and which is, you know, Oculus, Meta, um, a couple for two or three years. And I worked in their spatial audio research group uh, in Seattle in the U.S. And so I'm not an auditory uh, researcher myself. I'm an electrical engineer, but I was helping design prototypes and uh, technology to support the researchers. So I got to know uh, some of the researchers and the work that they're doing, and I found it absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, it was very, very interesting, all the different things that the, those researchers were working on. A lot of them had actually come from the hearing aid community. Um, a lot of the researchers came from, yeah, from working in its cochlear implants and things like that. Um, so it was just absolutely fascinating to learn about that. And that's, you know, that's kind of, what I'm trying to present to you today. So if we look at the human auditory system, um, I can trace through this. Um, so if you look at the shape of your ear, we'll talk about that. Um, so of course you have an ear lobe, which is called the pina. You have the ear canal. Um, of course, uh, audio signals are pressure waves, sound pressure waves, right, that go into your ear canal. They hit your eardrum. And after the eardrum, your inner ear is a fluid membrane, or, you know, this is a membrane. The inner ear is fluid. Um, and so there's a very big impedance difference, if you think of it from a signals perspective, right? So you have this pressure wave coming in, and all of a sudden you have a different impedance over here. Um, the audio signals come in. You have these three little bones in the inner ear, malleus, stapus, and incus, that's actually an impedance, that's evolved to be an impedance matching to efficiently take that acoustic energy, translate that into the, across this new medium, and then conduct it into your cochlea and uh, vestibular system, right? And so all of the vestibular system, 
The vestibular system is, you know, your sense of location. Yeah, I won't say too much more about the vestibular system, but if, if we think of it from an augmented and virtual reality perspective, you know, there's potential opportunities or problems to overcome related to the vestibular system, right, with, with motion sickness and things like that. So I just want you to start thinking about that. Um, you know, if, you, if you've used VR, you probably are aware that you can, you know, there, there can be some problems if, if you're in VR for too long because the, you know, a 3D scene, especially if it has motion, um, will confuse your brain, your vestibular system, since the vestibular system itself is not moving or not, the, the senses you're getting from that don't match what you're uh, experiencing in, in your VR. Um, but, but again, I, I won't go too far into that, but of course that is part of the auditory system. Um, the main part is the cochlea, right? Which is this conical tube where the, the, uh, the sound waves propagate through. And over on the right, we can look through and uh, this describes how, how the uh, energy gets translated into frequency responses. And you can think of it kind of like an FIR filter. Um, you know, it, it, it does a frequency translation. And, um, you know, so each, when it, whatever frequencies are coming through here, there's actually little hair follicles in the cochlea at the different points in the tube. And as they get vibrated at different points, they will stimulate nerves going into your brain at that frequency. And so then we've, we've learned how to resolve uh, and, you know, listen to sound by frequencies. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit, you know, we'll see a little more about that. But it's absolutely fascinating. All of this I find absolutely fascinating, especially when we think of VR and AR, um, just as how deeply connected to, you know, the, if you're designing a VR and AR system, how deeply you have to understand the human brain and your physiology um, in order to effectively recreate a sense of presence. And of course, there's an equivalent with, with eyesight, right, that, that they've worked out. And um, Okay, so how do our ears and brains resolve audio? So we, we kind of can see that this brain is able to or our auditory system is able to um, process incoming sounds. We have two ears. There's a whole bunch of different things, um, and I'll, I'll walk through these, different ways that our brains and our ears resolve that sound into a 3D system. Um, and so, yeah, th th there's different time, time differences as, as something's coming in. Um, when, you, when we walk through this, the best way to think of this, uh, think of it a little bit from an evolution perspective. What is the main reason or the big evolutionary advantage um, of, of uh, needing spatial audio as a predator or a prey, right? And so what that means is being able to track a, a, another animal in, in space, right? So something moving, right? Think of think of you're a prey, and and there's a lion or something out there. It's of course critically important for you to be able to know where that thing is in space. And so, um, if you think of just point sources of sound um, moving in space, that's that's a good reference for what we're trying to do here. And so, um, spatial audio would be tracking a series of point spaces uh, of sound sound. Uh, sources. And so, yeah, any animal that can localize sounds has a huge evolutionary advantage. And so that's likely how we've evolved to have this 3D audio system. Um, the primary, we can, call, we can call it a cue, the, the primary cue um, of, of locating sounds in space would be the interaural time difference, right? So, of course, our ears are located, you know, you know, this distance apart, right? Um, and so if there's a if there's a sound off on one side, that sound's going to hit one ear faster than the other. And so we're we're very attuned to that. And so we can get a 
phase, you know, we can, we can understand that phase difference very quickly and we can resolve the angle. Um, and so if you think of the speed of sound, um, speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second, which translates to 625 microseconds from one ear to the other. Well, if you, if you start thinking about that from a computation perspective, that's very slow. Um, so from a technology perspective, a lot of things we can do with audio is, is quite easy to do with modern computers. And so um, not that it's simple, you know, that the math can get complicated as you might see here, but it's quite feasible to do this in microprocessors and, and things like that. Um, and so we have this interaural time difference. And so if you think of like your head, the most important thing is kind of just on a plane, uh, resolving some sound source, uh, the angle of it. That's kind of the, the, the biggest uh, cue that we get. Um, the frequency response that that's most effective at is 270 to 1500 Hertz. And you might, hopefully you realize the, the, the response of a human uh, auditory system to sounds is around 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz, right? And that shrinks a little bit as you get older, but you know that's, that's the frequency range we're talking about. And speech itself is in a narrower range and some of these cues that we're going to talk about work at different frequencies or only at a subset of frequencies. Um, and so in this case, the main interaural time difference only works kind of in a narrow range. The second uh, cue is inter interaural intensity difference. And so if, if you have that point source coming at you at a certain angle, your head you know, your one ear is going to be slightly more directly focused toward that sound. The other will be a little bit away from it. And so one ear is going to be attenuated. That sound's going to be attenuated coming into one ear related to the other. And so we can easily pick up on that as well. And that's, that's better at higher frequencies, like above one kilohertz. Um, talking about localization accuracy, um, is much better. So, our, you know, our brains have, have, we've learned how to, and maybe because of the physiology of our head and our ears, uh, we can, we can resolve the, the angle much better looking straight on. And of course, that's probably why when you're really, when it's really important to know where something's coming from, we can turn our head, of course, to resolve, you know, to really figure out where some sound is coming from. Um, there's this concept of the cone of confusion. And so if you, if you have your head stationary um, and there's a sound coming from a certain point source and that sound is not moving, um, if, if you're only thinking about the interaural time difference and the intensity difference, you can't tell whether that sound is in front of you or behind you or above you. With, with the cues that I've just talked about. Um, if you think about the math of that, that becomes, they call that a cone of confusion. And so wherever a point source is, um, just looking at those cues, that sound could be anywhere. And so we need, we need some more cues to understand if something's behind you or above you. Um, and so we also have, there's the, the next, Part I'll talk about is called the head related transfer function. And this gets a little more complicated. Um, so if you think about the shape of your ear, um, you know, there's all kinds of bumps and, uh, you know, nodules and, you know, uh, that's called the pinna. From a frequency response perspective, that becomes a filter. And so any sound coming through that is filtered before it goes into your ear. And if you look on the right, um, you know, you can measure that. And, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide. But, you know, it's in research, they, they put a little microphone in your ear, and they can measure the sounds coming from every angle, and look at just, you know, just measure the frequency response. And so over here, there's a frequency response graph um, from your right ear and your left ear. Um, 
and you can see that over somewhere around six to eight kilohertz, there's a notch. And so your earlobe creates a notch filter naturally uh, that just that that absorbs more of that frequency before it goes into your ear canal. And so our brains have tuned that notch. And so that that notch, just because of the physiology, that that notch will change depending on the angle or the yeah, the angle vertically coming in. Um, so a sound above you, that notch will look a little bit different than whether it's in front of you or behind you. And we we are tuned very you know delicately to understand sounds or that notch. Of course, not cog you know not consciously, but um, and that's how we can resolve a sound coming on top you know above us, below us. Um, that notch below us, our bodies, our torso themselves uh, will will filter out some of the sounds, especially low frequencies and. Um, and so that also contributes to us understanding where sounds are coming from. That's called the head-related transfer function. So if you think of it from a matrix, you know, mathematics perspective, you could start thinking about all the data you'd have to compile for every angle, you know, a, a frequency response uh, associated with every possible angle. That sum of all those frequency responses, that's con considered a... Um, a head related transfer function. So we're starting to talk about signal processing here, right? Um, every body, we're, we all have slightly different physiology. And so uh, each of our HRTFs are slightly different. And so, um, but we're, we all, you know, generally have similar HRTFs. Um, so then the question is, could you make a generic HRTF that, you know, if, and, and I'll get into the technology part of that, but if we can leverage that HRTF to recreate sounds virtually, could we create a, an HRTF? Like if, if I have a certain HRTF and you have your own HRTF, if I used your HRTF to recreate something virtually, would I have the same sense of presence? And, and, and so there, a lot of work has been done on that creating a big set of HRTFs, could you come up with a common one that works for all people? And I'll talk about that as we, um, as we get into the virtual part of this. Um, so this is how you, you would come up with measuring people's HRTFs. So you put a tiny little microphone in your ear, you block the ear canal itself, and you just listen to sounds. So you go into a chamber, there, you know, they've created specialty chambers like the one on the right. And um, there's some dummy torsos that you could, you know, with, with a model of different ears, or you could put an actual human in the middle. And then you, you emit sounds along the complete sphere around a person. And so in this case, on the right, you'd have a dummy or maybe a, a person sitting on a chair and you have all these sound sources and um, one source at a time would be emitting a frequency and you measure the frequency response as it goes through the earlobe into a, you know, a microphone in your inner ear. Um, and then you would have to turn the person, right, in this case, or turn the whole room and measure every angle of, around the whole sphere. And then at the end, then you'd have a complete HRTF. So that's a lot of work um, to figure out people's HRTFs. That's the work that's been done to date to come up with a set of HRTFs that would, or maybe a single HRTF um, that maybe could work for, you know, that would be good enough that we could apply uh, a, a general, a generic HRTF that could work for all of us. Um, now these are, I'll continue talking about other localization cues that are less important. Those are the big three that through that we can, we can understand most, uh, most point sources of audio in a 3D sense. But there's other things, 
like um, sensing how far away an object is from us. And we do something, we can understand that from motion parallax. So back to thinking about predator and prey or um, some, let's say, uh, you know, a predator moving across a landscape. It's very important to know if that's close to you or far away. Um, there's a concept of motion parallax. If we hear something or a car, a car moving across, you know, near us would move quicker. Whereas if it's further away, it would take longer, even if it's going at the same speed. So we can tell, you know, how fast something moves. We, we innately know um, if it's closer or far away. Likewise, that same object moving, um, if it's further away, the high frequencies are going to be attenuated more than if it's closer. Um, and, and so we, we understand that. Um, of course, we understand reverberation and the acoustic environment that we're in. You know, we get a sense just from listening of what kind of room we're in based on the echoes. And they, they use the word reverberation. It's, it's all the same type of echoes. But if an echo is, if, if, you know, the reflection off of a wall takes less than 50 milliseconds, we call that reverberation because our brains just innately convolve that or, or understand that in a different way uh, than fast, longer than 50 milliseconds, our brains perceive that as an echo, kind of as a separate sound. Um, and so we, you know, of course, we understand the room, we get a sense of where, what space we're in through reverberation and echoes. And then finally, visual cues, you know, we, we associate, if I can see you talking, you know, then I, I, I can under, you know, I just, I figure out that you're, you know, that where you're coming from by looking at you. And, and then, you know, my brain kind of figures out what, where that location is. And, and of course, reading lips and, you know, all that. So that's another part of just cognitive uh, audio, you know, especially with speech, reading lips, you know, of course, is innately tied with, with understanding speech. Um, and then, you know, our brains always are, there's always a mismatch, right? There's little mismatches. And maybe you've already studied this in VR. Things are not quite perfect and we get errors in what we see. And our brains just kind of make a best guess as, as what the reality is behind any, you know, all this sensory input. If, if there's slight mismatches, our brains can tolerate that. So I'm going to talk about how do we capture audio. So we're heading toward now trying to leverage all this information we know about how the human brain and auditory system works and start to think of how do we recreate this virtually. Um, and I'll just say when, when we talk about the human uh, auditory system, we're actually more sensitive. Our auditory system is more sensitive to errors or perturbations in the auditory system than we are in the visual system. And so, you know, if you've noticed, you know, any kind of hiccup in an auditory, you know, listening to audio, we're, you know, you'll, your attention will immediately be broken if, if you hear a, a glitch in audio, more so than in video and, you know, in, in, in your eyes. And so just kind of think about that. So we're, we are very sensitive to little hiccups. Um, we're, we're maybe, like I was saying before, we're tolerant of mismatches in, you know, continuous errors, but glitches and things are, we're, we're very sensitive to audio wise. And so we want to, as we play back and capture audio, you know, we, we want to make sure we, we recreate this uh, consistently. And, and we, of course, we want to do this as accurately as possible. And so there's uh, techniques here where we can record a sound field, uh, and so if you think of, um, you know, let's say I'm going to, I'm, I'm in a concert venue and I want to record something in 3D, 3D audio, so that later I can play it back in a VR headset. That's kind of what we're talking about here. So that's called spatial audio capture. And the, the device on the right is a microphone with a, you know, a, a microphone array, in this case is a four microphone array 
oriented in a tetrahedral pattern that can capture the spatial audio sound field. And there's a there's an old technique or an old uh, recording format called ambisonics that came out even in the 1970s. So this is not very new. Um, but, so they've kind of been studying this for a long time, but now it's very relevant with modern VR and AR systems. Um, so if you just had four microphones in this pattern that I show on the right, that's called first order ambisonics. And that's enough to capture a, a spherical sound field. Um, and as you add more microphones, you could, you know, if you go up to nine channels oriented in a certain way, that's called second order. And the difference in there is maybe the angles of resolution that you can resolve um, in, in that sound field. And so it becomes more pre precise. But even first order ambisonic sounds quite good. And, and later I'll show you, like you can listen to this in YouTube with earbuds. Uh, you, you can just, you know, find uh, first order ambisonics in YouTube um, and or in in YouTube VR if you have a, a headset that can play videos uh, you you can actually you know see this for yourself and see how good ambisonic audio is right in YouTube um, but YouTube will only do first order ambisonics um, uh, an, an oculus or a meta quest type headset, I believe can do second order and maybe third order depending on the apps. And you could get more and more realistic audio that way. But you can, but the device on the right is how you'd capture the, the sound field. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is room acoustics. So the first one is just talk, you know, an actual live event capturing the audio in that event. A second way to do it is. I don't really care about what the audio is in a particular room, but I want to capture the the response of the field. And so the, you can use a similar device to understand the room response of, of any kind of room. And then you can model that room and later add sources, you know, virtually. And so think of a video game, right? And so we have some kind of space in, or, or let's say a church that, that you wanted to model and then later virtually add uh, sources to that that sound like they're coming from that church that with the, the correct uh, you know, uh, reverberation in that room. So there you'd create a binaural room impulse response, a BRIR. So you can create... If, if you're familiar with, you know, signal processing, often you have, you know, you compute impulse responses um, in, you know, in a, in a medium. Um, it's the same thing, but here it's, you're doing it in a 3D space. And, and so similar to the HRTF that we talked about before, you can do that for a whole room. And as you, as you start to combine these things, you know, your head related transfer function, and leverage this room impulse response, then you can start to think about, oh, now I can create a, an immersive virtual ex, uh, telepresence experience, for example. And so we combine that and we can now play back those kind of, you know, we've recorded our own HRTF, we've recorded either, either an ambisonic, you know, virtual concert, or you know, or you know, some some event, or just the room, you know, room response, and we want to play back sources that sound like they're coming from that room. We, you know, how do we play that back? And the term binaural audio is how you'd play back something into your own ears in a way that that sounds like you know that that you have that sense of presence where you're leveraging your HRTF. Um, playing playing a sound into your ears and that's called binaural right two ears binaural sound synthesis and so if we take a virtual audio or a set of audio sources that are mono that that are just kind of normal audio sources that have not been processed you can convolve those with the hrtf coming from a certain angle 
Um, so you do that filtering um, and you can convolve it with a particular room impulse response and um, and and you play them into your each of your ears and you'll all of a sudden have the sense of of immersion like like it was coming from that source or that room uh, so that's one way to do it ambisonic playback is these are all kind of variants of of how you can play with the the information that we've just talked about um, so you can basically take the binaural, so the binaural recording is kind of a sum of all angles. And so if you want to resolve that into just a particular angle of your head, then you 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 call that ambisonic playback at a particular you know, angle. And then there's different ways to, to think about that. So at a first spot, they can the, the easiest way to do that is you call it headlocked audio. So basically you take this, let's say an ambisonic spatial or spherical, you know, respond uh, spherical recording. Um, you have to kind of decide what what angle do you want your ears to be uh, on that sphere. And then you just you then you resolve that and you you create a binaural, uh, you know, output at a particular angle. And if you don't change that and you just keep that fixed throughout a recording playback, that's called headlocked audio. And what that means is if I angle that, if they, I have that response coming at a particular angle, I just play that back. If I move my head, but we keep that virtual playback the same, I'll hear that spherical or that, that spatial audio response. Um, <clears throat> And it won't change as I turn my head, right? That's called headlocked audio. And so think about that if, and maybe this is something you could do afterwards. If you have a pair of earbuds and you you listen to a YouTube spatial audio, that's what you're going to get is headlocked audio. Um, because it doesn't know that you've moved your head. It's just playing that at a particular spherical angle. The next one is three degrees of freedom. Uh, response. And so if you play back a YouTube VR video with spatial audio, that will know when you turn your head. And so it's every time you turn your head, it's going to change that angle of that spherical response. Um, and, and so it's going to track your head. So that's called head tracking. Um, just like that's, that's what happens in VR with with regenerating a video scene, right? As you move your head, um, you know it's it's re-rendering that. It's the same thing in audio. It's re-rendering for based on your head position. So a lot of these are the same kind of math that that VR uh, video generation is, or graphics generation is. And then of course, six degree of freedom is not just rotating a sphere but it's also moving in 3D space, right? Just like in V, so in VR graphics, you do that all the time, right? With a video game. Um, but if you think of it from audio, um, if it's a pre-recorded audio, that's very difficult because you didn't have that, the microphones located at different spots. And so the math gets a lot more complicated or just the scene, the knowledge of the, the scene is more complicated if, if you're trying to replay from a known scene, right? Does that make sense? Yes, please. Yeah. So yeah, so here's a here's an example of a 3D scene, right? Let's say this is a concert venue. Um, so this is something that that some company called Zillia did a few years ago. So they did a, a, uh, a recording of an orchestra. And so you can see that they modeled it as a 3D model. Uh, and they, they put these spherical microphones in multiple locations, right? So they recorded 600 audio channels and you can see the actual scene. And if you go on VR, you can find recording. Uh, if you can go on YouTube, you can find similar recordings of this. 
um, or there there might be uh, apps in in uh, you know on in uh, Oculus for this, and so each of these is a spatial audio uh, recording. But since they have multiple, then through you know mathematics, you could potentially walk yourself you know through this 3D scene and get six degree of freedom audio. So it starts to get very complicated, very fascinating. Um, I find listening to this kind of stuff in uh, just even on YouTube, especially in the Quest with with earbuds or headphones, um, but is a much better sound. Uh, but it's it's very realistic. I, I really enjoy listening to music in spatial audio uh, because you really do get that sense of presence. I'll talk a little bit. Think about the difference between putting on a head, like an over-the-ear headphone versus earbuds. Um, if you think about that, the over-the-ear earbud uh, earphones don't they that still has to go through your pinna, right, your earlobe, and so it's not going to be quite as realistic as an earbud. So an earbud is actually has a big advantage because that HRTF is going straight into your ear. Uh, and so an over-the-ear earbud, or even if you have a headset, a, a VR headset on, that's just an open ear speaker. Um, that's not gonna be quite as accurate because it it's still, your earlobes are still filtering that uh, unless you compensate for that. And, and other parts of the environment are still, you know, maybe messing with the, the sense of presence if you're trying to recreate a virtual source. So um, it's nice that, uh, you know, with, you can plug in an earbud uh, straight into a VR headset nowadays. Um, um, another thing I'll say is, you know, Bluetooth, at least current Bluetooth uh, earbuds are quite, they're very high tech, they're very good, but Bluetooth itself has fairly high latency. And so, if you had a VR or sorry, a Bluetooth headset, um, as you turn your head, the lag, um, you know, just as, as you get into modern, like a telepresence or something, there is a bit of a time lag with current Bluetooth. So you don't quite as good get a good sense of presence as we talk about three, uh, like a three degree of freedom. As you turn your head quickly, there, there might be a lag that that you'd notice through Bluetooth or some certain technologies. Um, I've mentioned some of these, but there are certain products that that support spatial audio today. Um, I've been talking about YouTube. Um, there's a lot of material on YouTube already, um, and and the nice thing about if if, if you have access to a, a, v, a VR head. Uh, headset from uh, Facebook or Meta. Um, you can play YouTube videos, uh, which are quite compelling. Um, Apple, of course, Apple earbuds, they do support spatial audio. Apple Music, uh, there's, there's a, a technology from Dolby called Atmos that records or saves audio as point sources in a 3D sphere or 3D space. And so that, that's a technology that then could get rendered in different ways. Um, of course, VR, all VR games have had spatial audio for a long time. That's a great technology, very sophisticated in gaming. Uh, media playback, we've kind of been, hopefully you kind of understand some of the behind the scenes of how that's being generated and recorded. Uh, VR meetings. Um, very good. It's, you know, it'll really help with a sense of uh, presence and talking to people with meetings. Alt space, I think that might be the one that Microsoft shut down. <laughs> I'm not, I, I think that might not be valid anymore. And then within these, uh, you guys may have started to work in Unity or getting familiar with the, the big uh, VR and gaming engines, Unity and Unreal. Those are just built in now. They they have very powerful spatial audio uh, technologies just built right in to the, like the Oculus SDK and all, you know, it's, it's very sophisticated now. So you can do 
you can play a lot. If you're starting to generate, uh, you know, getting into VR games or just other apps, um, start to think about the capabilities that you can do with spatial audio in, in right in those engines. And they some of that they've made it quite easy to 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 work with that. Um, AR glasses, uh, you know, is kind of coming. This is what I was working on at uh, Facebook. Um, and I'll talk about that as we get into hearing loss. But if you think about AR glasses, you can put a, a, an array of microphones right on the glasses. And so right there, you could potentially, if you do it correctly, you could capture 3D audio uh, straight in, in, uh, on a pair of glasses. Or, or on a VR headset. I think the, the, uh, the new Apple, Apple VR, I can't remember what that's called, the Pro uh, VR headset from Apple, I, I'm sure that has a big array of microphones. And so that could start to capture 3D audio directly on, on the headset. Um, and then we talked about headphones and earbuds. Like like Apple earbuds, if they have an an IMU or an accelerometer in there, then they can do head tracking right in the earbud, and so then they can tell when your head's moving. And like we talked about it, then they'll re-render a spatial audio playback that that's uh, you know. Th they, so I was talking about if you don't if you don't have the ability to track your head movement, that's called headlocked audio. So the audio just stays fixed to your head. If you can track it, that's called world locked, world locked rendering, and that's the same with with video as well. You know, you you have world locked rendering of video or or graphics. Um, so when we talk about more like gaming, or if you think about a gaming application, and you want to start to render a 3D audio in a space, um, then you can think about the mathematics and, and, and just how you would create that. And so, you know, you can build a model of a room, uh, you know, in a, in a gaming engine. And so if you think of a Unity gaming engine where you have a bunch of, you know, objects and a certain room size, then you could model the room acoustics of that room. Right, and if there's a ceiling or or a certain even material like like the material of the walls of stone versus something that's more so stone would be highly reflective uh, of echoes, whereas some other material would be more absorptive. So you can come up with room acoustic models, and then you have a set of sound sources in that room, and so then you could start creating, um, you know, path. There, there's uh, multiple different techniques of creating a virtual room impulse response. And there, there's more, there's simple and more complex ways of doing that. Um, and so these gaming engines and, and VR systems are, you know, adding more and more complex capability for modeling these rooms and building that right into the, the, uh, the gaming engine. And this has been around for a while, but it, it's getting more and more uh, sophisticated. Do you guys have experience with that of playing games, or um, you know, have you have you guys kind of seen some of this before? For me, it is my first time. I haven't used it before. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. Yeah, well, so, and are you guys going to be using, like, gaming engines? I know you're, this is kind of a short course. Currently using Unity. You're not planning to? They're using Unity at the moment. Oh, you are going to use Unity. Okay. 
Yeah, well, as you start digging into Unity, um, I would suggest at least just pull up the spatial audio features, right? Just to kind of note that they're there and, and you can start to see what, what uh, things that they offer. Because, um, you know, it's once you're up to speed on Unity, adding things like that is not that difficult. Um, and it, it can be, you know, if you're going to create a VR game or some app, adding audio really will assist in the sense of presence. Yes. All right. So we kind of talked about kind of more the VR, AR systems. Um, the last part here is more talking about hearing hearing loss and impairment and how we can use some of these technologies and understanding of our auditory system to correct for problems. Um, and I find this absolutely fascinating um, because this is more about the brain, you know, uh, and cognition, cognitive science. Uh, you might have problems, you know, with, with your hearing system, but the problems really manifest them in, into your brain and, and related to your attention. And so um, we, we started, you know, early on, I was describing how from an evolutionary perspective, our, our auditory system likely evolved to track objects in space, like predator and prey type things. And, um, you know, in the real world, probably in an environment that did not have high noise or a lot of different auditory point sources. But if you think of the real world, especially in a city, it's just a cacophony of sounds, right? Or, or even in a restaurant or a, a bar or, you know, um, you know, a, a noisy room. Um, and so if you have any kind of, well, even if you don't have impairment, as you get into a noisy room, there's just more and more auditory system, uh, auditory point sources that you have to filter out if you want to have a conversation with somebody, right? And of course, we're all familiar with that. Um, and so that you can think of the word co or the phrase cognitive load to, you know, so when you're in a, a noisy environment, you have to spend cognitive resources filtering out all that background noise um, just to, you know, if you and I are trying to have a conversation, um, of course, we know how to do that. We naturally do that. But as you get older or if you have cognitive or if you have hearing impairment, that gets more and more difficult. And so you have to spend more cognitive resources just focusing on the other person. And maybe you're really maybe you're mostly just trying to read their lips at that point because you can't hear anything and you get exhausted. And so, um, you know, and at some point you kind of give up. And if you think of older people or people that have hearing loss, um, as you get older or as as you just struggle more and more to uh, listen in, you know, in more and more environments, um, you kind of maybe check out a little bit. And, and that'll lead to cognitive decline because you just, it's just so taxing on your brain that it's just, it's just harder and harder. And so it can lead to social isolation, which can further cognitive decline. So there's major implications for hearing loss, especially in noisy environments. And so there's things we can do with these new technologies to try to, to help uh, offset some of that. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can apply technologies of putting in earbuds that you know, or hearing aids, or newer versions of hearing aids that can filter out some of that background noise. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, just kind of a side thing is this ASMR. Um, this is not necessarily for audio, for uh, cognitive impairment, but just another side response, um, just of how interconnected our senses are um, this ASMR, you know, our brains are used to hear, uh, receiving when, when, when some noise, let, let's say a, if you're shaving, like with a, uh, let's say you're getting a haircut and there you have a, 
uh, electronic razor or something buzzing near your head, you're going to physically feel like some of the hairs on your skin buzzing from the from the acoustical vibrations, as well as hearing it through your ear. Um, you, you're, you, you, you've trained your, your brain has learned to associate that, that physical response of that vibration and the auditory response to where if you replay just the auditory response without the actual buzzing, your brain will still generate the, internally the physical uh, vibration responses. And you'll literally feel your skin vibrating, um, even if that's not that source is no longer present, just by replaying a very accurate rendering of the acoustic part. That's called ASMR, Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And so that's just a, it's almost like a parlor trick or something. Um, but there's clever things. And if you go on, um, if you go on YouTube, there's a whole, it's almost like a fetish type, uh, you know, maybe sexual, but just some kind of fetish of people that really derive enjoyment uh, out of out of listening to playback of these type of of uh, uh, of responses that that do not have the physical vibration, but they can still pick up. You know, they've been recorded in those kind of environments. So it's just kind of another side of this that I'll just mention there. Um, so I kind of talked about this, um, the cock, so the cocktail party effect is when you're in a noisy environment, having to focus, um, to focus your energy, to filter out background noise, that's called the cocktail party problem. Um, and so I basically kind of covered that earlier. And so there's a lot of research and, and, product development to try to help in that. Um, and so we talked about AR glasses a little bit. And, you know, of course, hearing aids have been around a lot, uh, a long time. And they, modern hearing aids do have multiple microphones and they do, they're starting to be able to kind of try to focus on, if you think of like a, a beam, beam forming filter, um, if, you know, one way to, to do this is if you could have beam forming microphones that just listen to what's going on in front of you. That's one way where you could try to filter out sounds behind you. That would be one, you know, kind of a, an initial way of trying to create an uh, assistive hearing device that if, you know, that just focuses on conversation. And as long as you're looking at the other person, maybe you can, you can suppress sounds behind you. Um, to some level. But if you have more microphones, let's say on a pair of glasses, might be a better environment where you could have a whole bunch more microphones across a wider area. That gives you an opportunity to really create a nicer, a nicer beam forming microphone system uh, combined with earbuds. And of course, earbuds have the advantage that they block out the normal sounds and replace it with virtual sounds or whatever sounds you want to just give the listener. Um, and so a lot of the, the work that was being done at Facebook when I was there was on, on systems like that. And they, they also term, uh, they work on things called source selection, which is basically you and I are having a conversation with each other. You are the source that I want to focus on, but, maybe you're moving and you know maybe i'm keeping my head head still and you're moving and so i want to be able to track you in space and and keep the, let's say a beam forming microphone trained on you um even if i'm not looking directly at you and so maybe i have a camera in you know on my glasses and it knows that i'm i want to listen to you or maybe there's two or three people two or three of us in a conversation um, and I want to listen to multiple people. And if you're, if one person's talking, I want that beam forming microphone trained on that person. But if another person 
starts talking, I want to switch that, you know, my attention to a, a different person and quickly switch the beam forming uh, to that person. And, and so that, that's called source selection. Um, and so there's a ton of research and, but you can already think of like a VR headset could already do that, right? Because it has these front facing cameras, but of course a, VR, a current VR headsets are fairly clunky. Uh, but if you can think of those shrinking over the next 10 years, uh, a lot of work can be done to improve that. Um, the, I think this is the final thing I was going to talk about is modern designs of earbuds. So all related to what we're, we've already been talking about, but let's, let's think of it where I'm also talking, right? You and I are having a conversation. I have all these nice features of beam forming or suppressing the environment, but once you put an earbud in your ear, your own voice is actually amplified because the vibration of your voice is going through your internal bones and your, you know, your internal system. And that actually, normally that, that energy, that acoustic energy goes out your ear canal. And, and we, we, we know how to kind of listen to our own voice. But if you block that uh, because of it, having an earbud in, there's an internal reflection or a, a reflection off of that earbud back in, and that creates kind of a, a, an acoustic problem called uh, boominess, right? And um, I mean, you can tell it just if you plug your ear, right? And I'm sure you've all had earbuds in and the sound is, is not as good. Um, and so mo there's a modern, you know, signal processing technique to sometimes they call it hear through or talk through um, where they've done some signal processing to, to allow that energy to be suppressed and, and to allow you to have a conversation where your own voice sounds correct. And so this kind of talks about what's happening here uh, internally. And so you have, right, if you're talking, some of your own voice is coming externally back into your ear. Some is coming internally. A lot of that comes through your your station tubes, the station tubes, um, and echoes internally. So there, so you can create signal processing filters to cancel, to do internal noise canceling of that energy. And so here's kind of some the block diagram of how that's happening. And you know, modern, a lot of modern earbuds can do that now. So anyway, I hope hopefully. Uh, this talk kind of gave you a lot of different background of both the auditory system, um, how, you know, how our brains work, some cognitive science, um, all the different virtual techniques for taking advantage of that, um, both in terms of like gaming and VR and AR, as well as mitigating hearing loss problems. Okay, so... Uh, for me, I have a, a question. It's about Unity. Uh -huh. I don't know if I can share my screen. Oh, yeah, I can stop sharing mine. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, so we are working on this uh, project. Sorry. Oh, yes. And... Uh, we would like to integrate the uh, the voice. So, do you know any libraries that we can use? Because some of them we find that they are not compatible with what we are uh, with the unity that we have. So, I'm wondering if there is a way, yeah, we can, yeah, we can integrate it, the the voice in this, uh, yeah. Yes. Um... That's a good question. I haven't done this in a little while. Are you are you using the Oculus SDK? No, this is Unity. Yeah, I, I'm not using uh, Oculus. Or I mean, there's it's within Unity. Yes. Um, when you it's a so 3D, are you? 3D yeah. environment. 
are you trying to export this to work in a in a VR headset? Or are you just staying within this unity? Uh, yeah, if times allow, I can also do that. But for now, I want to be able to speak with it in the this environment. So I, I, I believe that the spatial audio is tied to the Oculus SDK, and so I believe, or open no it's not just oculus it's uh open uh let me see um it's it might be called open xr let's see okay um let me i'm gonna look it up here um there's there's a common xr development package for unity mm -hmm. that um let me see I think it's called yeah. I think it's called OpenXR, okay. and um, yes. So I think it's called so it's within audio. Um, here, I'm, I'll put it in the chat here. Okay. Um, so they call them audio spatializers. And it looks like they they might have diff, different platforms have different spatializers. They're basically plugins, and so like you'd you'd need to implement or add the Oculus spatial or spatializer for Unity if you're going to render to an Oculus headset. But if you're you know if you're doing to some other system, you know like Microsoft. You'd 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 pull it, you'd you'd have to use a different plugin, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. And I, I, it might there might be more common ones out there that that allow you you know to kind of develop a game that that you could export to multiple platforms and keep the same audio features. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh-huh. And yeah, of course, as we mentioned before, the yeah, your sense of presence, adding audio to a game, of course, really enhances the sense of presence and getting it having the spatial audio definitely will help. Um, but it it yeah, you'll have to kind of put that sound. I mean, there you can of course add background sounds and that right there gives you a sense of presence. You know, if you could have birds chirping or something. But adding a point source, you know, from, you know, some other, like a, if it's a shoot up, shooter game, having that sound coming from the shooter or whatever, um, if it really sounds like it's coming from there, then, you know, or coming from behind you, right? And, and you, you, that gives you a cue that you need to turn around. Of course, that, get, that really adds to the sense of presence. Yeah, Joel, I see you have a question or comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I was wondering if there are any specific limitations to spatial audio nowadays. And if there are um, any workarounds to them. Um, limitations in just how effective they are or on what platforms they run? Or... Uh, any, any, any limitation, maybe. Uh, maybe something uh -huh. that will make me to consider maybe other options? Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends on what, what you're trying to do, right? And um, so I guess it, I'll phrase it in terms of like how, how good of a sense of presence can you create? And do you need to create for a particular experience that, you, that you're trying to develop? Um, so I mentioned HRTFs, um, yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about HRTFs a little bit. And so these audio spatializers that, that I sent the link for, those use an HRTF behind the scenes, right? And that's, that's the core of what they're using to render, uh, the audio at a particular angle, right? Those, those, um, 
those HRTFs are a generic HRTF, right? They, they, they measured the HRTF from a couple hundred people, let's say, and, and created the best one that fit, let's say, 80 or 90% of the population. You know, they did a lot of user studies, right, over the past 10 years, and they determined that, yeah, 80% of the population gets a really good spatial experience from that. But maybe 20%, maybe 10% of the population, remember th th that notch filter might be, you know, you know, 10% of the population, that filter is just not quite accurate. And so you just don't have a good experience. So that's kind of the state of the art. And so there's a lot of research to figure out how to customize the HRTF, personalize it for each of us, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to get better, whether it's in a VR headset or even in earbuds, right? Because now like playback in Apple Music or Google Music, um, if you had a personalized HRTF, that would sound a lot better. Um, that's one part. That'll, that's kind of maybe where the state of the art is. The other one is, I was mentioning earbuds versus like you have an over-the-ear or an open-ear headphone that's your earlobe is still going to be filtering that different differently. And some people prefer over the ear and, you know, some want in ear. And so not everyone wants an earbud in all the time. And um, so that, you know, so as we personalize the HRTF, things will get better, but you know, how, how good can you do it um, with these different technologies? Um, I'll just say, one technique that they're talking about for personalizing HRTFs is let's say you take your cell phone with your camera and you do a little video recording, right? And through, you know, through modern graphics or, or visualization techniques, you could model your earlobe. And so maybe in a couple of years, they'll come out with a, an app or a, a little self calibration mechanism to get a personalized HRTF by just scanning your own earlobe and that'll be enough to get a 3d model of your own ear and and personalize so i know they're working on things like that we'll see how how successful they are um and then yeah so th the work we were doing at or some of the work that my group at facebook was doing is actually creating an earbud that fit way inside your ear they call that an inner ear earbud and you know the further in you can go, um, you know the the more you're replacing all of your own hearing, your your own you know your 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 kind of middle your you know your the outer part of your inner ear, right? And um, so it gets better and better as you are able to shrink the electronics and put put that earbud way into your ear, but it the comfort level goes down, and so. There's a, there's a human factors part of that. And so, you know, and I, we have, when I was at Meta, we had, we had really interesting demos and, you know, prototypes that would go way into your ear. And it was just amazing sense of, sense of presence. But it's not clear that you could create a product that most of the population would be comfortable using, right? And so that's kind of the state of the art is like trying to figure out how do you, how do you replace, you know, do a full virtual replacement of your outer ear in a way that's comfortable that people would be willing to use for a long term. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure many of you already use earbuds most of the day, right? Or you're, you know, maybe you have different levels of comfort, right? And some of you can tolerate that or enjoy it and some don't, right? So you can, you just talking amongst yourselves, you'll probably realize you already have a, a range of comfort uh, with the current products. Yeah, um, thank you for, for answering that question. Uh, I had a, another follow-up one. Uh, just out sure. of curiosity, could, um, could special audio be enjoyed on regular headphones, or is it is it something that requires specific technology to work? Um, I, this is something you can try yourself. And, you know, after the meeting, we can... Um, you could go to YouTube with those headphones that you have on and just search for spatial audio and you'll be able to play it. Um, if you had a pair of wired hear, 
wired or even just wireless earbuds, you can try, you can, if you swap them out, you'll see a difference. Um, and um, like I was saying, you know, the over the ear, you'll still get a sense of spatial. It, you'll still resolve stuff with the earbuds or earphones you have on, but not as well as if you had a earbud. And my experience is ear wired earbuds, which are less and less common, might actually work better than than like Bluetooth earbuds. Um, um, so yeah, they, they work, or even if you have an Oculus headset, that's a fully open ear. Um, the spatial audio is okay in open ear. You know, they've done tuning to it, um, but it's not nearly as good as having an earbud. Thanks a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, just picking your mind. Um, what do you think the future of spatial audio is? Do you, do you think maybe um, all games will come to incorporate it or all movies and cinemas, all forms of entertainment or music? What do you think? Um, that, that's a good question. I'd say mo like movies, like in a movie studio, they've had spatial audio for decades, right? That's what, you know, Dolby, THX, you know, those... Those have had space, you know, some kind of spatial audio for many, many years. Um, in terms of the personalized, because it is compelling, I think it will continue to be become more and more relevant. Um, you know, I in general, you know, I think, you know, like they're trying to figure out how to do AR on a pair of glasses, right? That's, you know, the big picture of just AR. Not even talking about audio is. You know, I know Facebook and Apple and all these companies, they're trying to make an AR system that can work on your pair of glasses um, that you'd be able to use all day that, I, you know, the goal there is that you wouldn't need your cell phone, right? That this would be, you know, it'd have a screen um, that, that would replace the cell phone or, you know, maybe you'd still have a, a cell phone type device, but for most interactions, you'd interact just through your glasses and maybe hand controls, right? Um, I think audio will become a big part of that. And it's not, you know, back to some of the challenges that I mentioned of, are we willing to have an earbud in our, in our ear all the time? Um, maybe not. Um, maybe, you know, they'll have to figure that out. How, it, it's unclear maybe for certain uses, right? You know, I, maybe you guys can kind of tell me how, or, you know, we can discuss how often, how much of the day do each of you spend with an earbud in your ear, right? Um, so it, it's, you know, each of you can assess, like, you know, based on current technology, how comfortable is that? How compelling, you know, right? If, if you know, if, if, if you have things going on virtually, you know, of, that you would like to listen to music or talk to people, you're probably spending a lot of your day already with with things in your ear. Um, that'll just continue. And if there's more and more compelling content, then you're probably more and more willing to have something in your ear. And then they'll have to figure out the comfort part. Um, so, but with you know, let's say five or ten years from now, there's there's some products on the market that are that are glasses that are start, you're starting to use these glasses instead of your cell phone. Um, the, the audio part of that will be important, right? Of jumping in and out of calls or maybe playing games and who knows what that'll look like, but kind of the way I was describing it is there's different levels of experience based on an open ear. You know, I don't think that'll change too much. Like the open ear speaker, gives you a certain level of augmentation of audio. But if you have an open ear, like you have, or like an over the ear, I'll call that, that gives you a next level of immersion and an earbud gives you the best immersion. And so there's kind of those three levels and maybe maybe all three will be available and you'll get to choose based on, uh, you know, how how important it is to you to have a certain level of spatial immersion.
Bro, so um, I want to clarify the the special audio on your Oculus headset. Uh, that does it make use of the ear, or it's it's only just uses the the neurons? I don't know, but I just want to clarify if it makes use of the ear. That your ear, your sound, like yes, yes. Um, let me see. So I have a headset here. Um. I don't know if you can see that. So the this is the Oculus Quest 2. Um, if you look, let me see if I can take this off. Um, so if you look at the headband, there's this plastic piece. And then you have the, the flexible strap. This headpiece is actually an acoustic resonating cavity. So the speaker, um, you see this. I don't know if, if you can see that. There's a little circle here. The speaker is behind where this piece is attached. And then this is a hollow tube where the audio resonates. And then on the inner part, you see a little hole. So the actual audio comes out here. And this is an open ear speaker. And they've they've designed this piece of plastic. I don't know how they did it, but they've they figured out how to actually get that sound to be pretty good coming out of the little hole just outside your ear. And so when you put on the strap, the actual audio is kind of conducted down this like a waveguide, an acoustic waveguide, I guess you'd call it. And then it goes right into your ear. Um, so that's that's how this headset works. Okay. It's still an open ear. It's still an open ear headset. Uh, speaker. Okay, so um, the, the reason I asked that question, I remember in your presentation you made mention of um, special audio being used as um, a hearing aid. Ah, yes. Yeah, so how how would that be done if it, it makes use of the ear for someone who cannot hear at all? I think you'd have to use an earbud. You you have to block. I I think you'd basically have to block out the current sounds of the environment, kind of like we you know we were talking about with Joel. You you'd want to first block out <clears throat> the external sounds, and you really need an earbud earbud, kind of as an earplug right, <laughs> or a noise canceling earbud, and then you you really kind of need it in that earbud form. That's how hearing aids work right, is they kind of block. And then they add in the external sounds after they've been filtered to, you know, to correct or, you know, to enhance the audio for whatever, to correct for whatever hearing loss or impairment or to improve whatever you're trying to listen to. So I think it's hard to do that with an open ear speaker. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, if there is no other question, uh, thank you so much for giving us this lecture. I think we have learned a lot, and for people who are not there, I have recorded the meeting. We we'll go back and um, listen to, to it again. Thank you so much for coming. All right, thank you guys. It was very nice to meet you. Enjoyed okay. chatting.